Transport in China is already responsible for 25% of its greenhouse gas emissions, but at the moment, it only has around 70 million cars. China were to move to the US situation, you'd have something like six to 700 million cars on the road, which is more than three times as many cars as there are in the US. That would have a really, really dramatic impact on greenhouse gas emissions if those were all driven by petrol engines. Adapting to electric cars could reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and boost the green economy. But electric cars are only 1% of the global car market. If they're going to have a big impact on uh, climate change, then we've got to increase that from 1% to 50% or more. The price has to come down. The technology has to be made really robust. We probably need to improve battery technologies. All that means that you, know, you aren't going to see electric cars taking over the market quickly anywhere, in particular in China. The GV mission statement is make good cars that are the safest, most environment friendly, and most efficient. But when it comes to electric cars, they're hedging their bets. I think it will be a, a, not a wise idea to force customers to buy something which in reality still takes some time to get a, a better maturity. That's why for Geely, we are preparing you know, for both. You can't just gamble on one side and forget the other side. Then I would say the company will run into an operation risk very quickly. The current infrastructure is geared to petrol-based cars. Changing to charging stations for electric vehicles is a big challenge. It looks as if gas guzzlers are here for some time, unless governments try to ban them. That's ridiculous. I wouldn't think any government will do so. And in the other governments wouldn't do so, why Chinese government should do so? That's, uh, I mean, unbelievable decisions. You have to be realistic. Experts say the best hope for electric cars is that they will be 10% of the market by 2030. So Geely are developing solar-powered cars and hybrid technologies, as well as improving the energy efficiency of the fuel-based cars. Mr. Zhao's car ambitions are commendably green. But nothing is as environmentally friendly as pedal power. And electric cars are not the answer if the electricity comes from unsustainable sources. Shanghai's buildings are big, bold, and bright, and burn massive amounts of energy. Whether it's night or day, a boat trip is the best way to see the famous skyline. Well, they say that 50% of all the building in the world will happen in China in the next 15 years, and a large part of that is here, right here in Shanghai. This has been built in the last 15 years. This entire Pudong did not, 20 years ago, it did not exist. And it's happening so quickly that perhaps we can't get control of this juggernaut. What happens here, make or break, not only China, but the rest of the world. The old, poorer areas of Shanghai can still be seen nestling in amongst the new skyscrapers. Knocking them down and building new blocks is necessary to give these people even a basic standard of living. But making the poorer residents better off is making the world worse off. China's rapid building program is responsible for 20 to 30 percent of its greenhouse gas emissions. Shanghai leads the world in buildings that have more than 30 floors, and this is only the beginning. The Urban Planning Museum already displays new buildings that will soon be added to the famous skyline. But Shanghai is sinking. It has sunk more than two meters since 1921. Geologists blame pumping out too much underground water and the rapid construction of skyscrapers for accelerating the rate at which the city is sinking. These are the kind of problems that urban planners like Professor Xian Nankai have to address. 
啊，上海的呃地面下降速度呢，已经从过去的平均每年下降两点几厘米，也下降到百只有一点几厘米了。啊，这个确实也是由于城市规划。Urban planning has been behind promoting renewable sources of energy, increasing green areas, and cleaning up the city's drinking water. 作为上海来说，很希望把自己的城市成为一个世界上的一个典典范的城市。现在，上海市政府每年呃去年去年投入在环境保护上的总的花费呢是四百二十二亿人人民币，占整个呃 GDP 的百分之三点零八。That figure will have to increase because urban planners are expecting the population, which doubled in the last 10 years, to double again in the next 10. For recycler Mr. Zhao, the massive expansion of Shanghai means more waste and more business. On a good day, he can fill up the back of his tricycle at least three times. It's Shanghai's mix of wealth and grinding poverty that makes it possible for Mr. Zhao and the other recyclers to help reduce the city's carbon footprint. As China gets further into its stride as a modern economy, the recyclers will find other ways of making money. China's cities generate an average of 120 million tons of garbage a year, and it's growing by 8% a year. In addition to his regular customers, Mr. Zhao uses his bell to attract more business. It accounts for about half his income. For Mr. Zhao, every piece of rubbish is a business opportunity. Mr. Zhao is making an important contribution to Shanghai's 2010 Expo. Better city, better life. The aim is to persuade future architects and builders to make their constructions greener. But that vision of the future is threatened by what is going on now. Shanghai is throwing up big buildings at an incredible rate, and unfortunately, they're building them to somewhat old-fashioned energy efficiency standards. And that means that 50 years from now, when those buildings are still operating, they'll be using a lot more energy than they will really need, and that'll be boosting greenhouse gas emissions. Inefficient buildings can be made more efficient. This building was constructed in 1996. It would be very expensive to change the shell now. But on the 26th floor, Shu On Development Limited have recently refurbished their offices to be as green as possible. Architect Michael Kwok helped design a range of energy saving ideas. For example, the light levels in the open plan area change according to the level of light outside. If it's not enough, there's always the traditional desk lamp with energy-saving bulbs. A control panel monitors CO2 levels in the office, and energy is saved by supplying less fresh air to empty meeting rooms. As a result, energy consumption has fallen by 25%. The cost of the renovation is just less than 1% more than what you would normally do in a typical office fill-out. This minimal investment will be able, will be able to um, have the return within three to five years. Building from scratch is even more cost-efficient. If you consider green building or sustainable development in the very beginning of a design process, it actually costs you nothing. We are talking about natural daylight, natural ventilation, those are free. But property developers have little incentive to construct greener buildings. As soon as they're finished, they sell them, and any profits from cheaper running costs go to the new owners. Shanghai's buildings may be costing the earth, but they're certainly a tourist attraction. Tourists are scared to step from a solid floor onto the glass. They're perfectly safe, 
But this building, the Pearl Orient, and all the others in Pudong are at risk. They're all built on low-lying ground that has been reclaimed from the sea. Each year, Shanghai adds 3,000 hectares of new territory this way. The danger is that sea level rise could cause the land to return to being underwater. The war against climate change will be fought on many fronts. Finding the means and the money to adapt will be critical. Coming up in part two, countries like India show the way forward in low-cost, practical solutions.